this really documentary i feel like it was kind of sad um kind of depressing i'm not gonna lie more depressing than i thought it would be and i think it's because of my general shift in my kind of attitude to kind of clubbing and going out and stuff and partying and drinking and doing drugs and stuff has kind of changed over the years and i'm obviously a little bit more um chill than i was maybe a few years ago so the kind of um excitement or the kind of hype or the sort of like you know enthusiasm i'd have for watching this sort of stuff is sort of gone and i kind of watch it with like a little bit of a concerned eye and i also kind of picture myself in that position and think to myself rah man i'd be super depressed if i ended up being this kind of person what am i talking about i'm talking about this documentary courtesy of vice um which is called a non-stop party the dark side of ibiza um the full ep episode is here it's like 20 minutes long but they've also got a clip that's like four minutes so i'm going to play but essentially the journalist from vice heads out to ibiza and speaks to people who basically work there seasonal workers drug dealers um people that just live there and party folk in general about you know the non-stop party side of ibiza and how dark it can get and my whole knowledge on ibiza in general has mostly been through documentaries especially within like the kind of balearic scene that's sort of kind of my vision my idealistic kind of picture of ibiza you know this kind of like hippie commune this kind of like um you know adventure playground for like adults who'd never want to grow up and it kind of again it kind of had like a an island burning man sort of vibe to it that's kind of how i saw it and it kind of felt like an alternative to going from like you know this typical city like um clubbing culture and scene that i'm probably used to in places like london berlin and all other places and whatnot um you kind of get like this vibe of like being somewhere hot and the beach and the sun and stuff so it kind of feels vibey but I've also never had the impulse to go, um, mostly because of the music. I'm not really, you know, into raving to flipping tech house and deep house and, you know, business techno and stuff. It's not really the kind of stuff that I'm really into. And that's usually what they kind of play out there. I do know there are some people doing interesting, cool, kind of, you know, progressive, avant-garde, um, you know, alternative kind of parties from the typical mainstream stuff. But really and truly, you don't go to Ibiza to kind of hear underground stuff. You go there to hear like the big commercial people play back to back to back to back, especially at places like Pasha and DC 10 and whatnot, right? Circo Loco. So cool. Makes sense. But I've also heard on the flip side that it is a place similar to Berlin, similar to London, probably, where you can get lost in the source. You can easily, easily get lost in the source to the point where your life completely just revolves around getting fucked up um, and it can be hard to kind of get out from that hole. And this documentary does a really good job of detailing how quickly you can get lost in the source, especially when they talk to the seasonal workers who obviously go there during the festival season, um, and which I think extends from like spring all the way until like late, late, late in the year, maybe October this time, right? They kind of stretch it as far as possible. Then they have like, you know, end of season parties here in London when you're finishing shit in other major cities. So, you know, the, the need to kind of continue partying is really strong. So that happens. And um, this documentary, again, like I said, does a really good job in terms of depicting it. So I'm going to play the clip here. This is, the clip is called Drug Dealing to Survive. I believe this eternal sesh is a clip taken from um, Vice High Society and it does a really good job of kind of showing you the dark, bleak side of this. But like I said before, there was a time in my life where these type of sessions were, these type of sessions were something that you would kind of long for. You'd be like, oh my God, I wish that was me. And then now the older you get and the more experience you have with stuff and the more you kind of, you know, change your priorities in terms of what you go out for. It's more about the music and seeing DJs and stuff and maybe connecting with people. The less stuff like this kind of fills you with any kind of FOMO. If anything, you kind of feel bad for the people like, fuck man, imagine what that life is like on a daily basis. So let me play this clip for you so you can see what I mean. For those seasoned workers who have pivoted to the drug trade and kept it professional, there is serious organised crime level money to be made. Aidan has gone quickly from bartending to making an absolute fortune dealing. So where are we going now? We're going to go drop off some money for a bit of load. It's not really a rush on it, but I just want to get it gone because I don't really want it in the house anymore. Are they part of a gang, the person that you owe this money to? No, they're probably one of the few people that are similar to me that just prefer to work alone. And did he originally come here as a season worker? Pretty sure he did, yeah. Is that how you came here? Yeah, I used to work behind the bar for probably the first two years I was here until I seen the light a little bit. And then I started selling from behind the bar and it got to a stage where I was missing sales and the sales were worth a lot more than what I was earning behind the bar. So after like a week or two of realising the potential, I just kind of quit. Jesus. 
that story isn't unique. Most metropolitan cities, you know, if you want to get some coke and stuff, or you want to get some pills, you want to get some MDMA, you want to get some weed, usually cool little, you know, cocktail bars or just regular pubs and stuff, you're going to be able to score some stuff from bartenders because usually those guys take the stuff themselves or they're in contact with people that maybe deal in the place. So it's not that far fetched to see the scenario play out, play out in other places. What is a bit far-fetched is something that, that you definitely don't see all the time. Our bartenders quitting their bartending job to be full-time dealers because they're making too much money, you know, dealing the odd gram and whatnot for people throughout the night. So that kind of led, you know, leads you to kind of understand, imagine the amount of people who are going out there. Imagine the amount of people who are going out there on a daily if not weekly basis, monthly basis, you know, flipping, buying drugs and whatnot, trying to score it. Imagine how many people are doing it. Imagine how often that must be happening. It must be flipping insane to the point where this guy can flip in, you know, it kind of even enters his mind to quit his job and decide to start dealing drugs full time. The amount of people out there scoring must be on another level. Yes, that is a wad of cash. How much is that? 18,660, I think. And that's money that you've made for someone? Yeah, that's that's his portion of the money that I owe. And what's the portion that you got? I probably made just over double that. So he's going to give some cash to another dealer, who I'm assuming he got his supply off. It's 18,000 euros, and he's saying that he made double that. I can see why he stopped working as a bartender. No, you got another order there. What's it for? So it's only a small one, one coke, one MD, one pills. But I'm desperate at the minute because it's so quiet. Because it's the end of season? Yeah, and I have so much stock left to get rid of. So would you consider yourself low level scale? Yeah, the lowest of the low, really. Even though you're making yeah. times two, 18,000? I think even the worst deal, I would struggle to make less than 30 grand in a season. If they're making less than. That, that says a lot about the people that are going out there, to be fair. No, I think they shouldn't even be bothering and risking it. Like. Aidan has his first deal of the day, so the crew has to sit creepily in the back. How are you? Yeah, I'm you. All good. If, if anyone's asking for a number in a hotel, will you pass on my number? Yeah, we'll Cheers. See you later. She was not friendly at last time. Last time she was dying to shag me, so she... Oh, God. Seen. She's seeing her in the front now, thought she's my girlfriend. <laughs> she's raging. So the way that I understand it is there's a lot of different gangs that operate on the island. Do the seasoned workers never piss these people off? Like, seasoned workers are so minuscule on that scale that I don't think it really matters. Like, I think these them three groups are more to do with the importation. It's none of their business, really. Do workers ever get themselves into sticky situations? It's a hard island to actually keep your head and stay focused on, so I think it probably does happen a lot. I think it's fairly common that they go through their own supply. Like, and you? I don't touch any drugs, so it's purely money for me. And that's probably the only way to do it. That's probably the only way to survive out there, I'd imagine. It's a full-time, you know, spring, summer, and maybe autumn sesh. So the only way to actually survive if you are going to be out there dealing drugs is to be somebody that's kind of, you know, that trying to treat it like a business. You don't partake in your gear whatsoever. You just sell it and you just keep it moving. That's the probably the only way to do it. But can you imagine how difficult it must be to kind of maintain that level of self-discipline? Unless you're obviously sober and made decisions to do so. But if you're not and you're just doing it by choice, just to kind of be there bored throughout the day sometimes. So you don't get, you know, when your phone line isn't ringing as often in your home to just not touch that fucking brick or those couple of baggies that are kind of zipped up underneath your fucking bed. That must be difficult. But of course, that is the only way to survive in these kind of places and make some actual, um, you know, sustained, substantial money that can maybe get you off the island and get you back to some level of normality. Probably wise, to be fair. So what's this guy getting? This guy's getting a quarter of coke, which I'm doing very cheap because I'm trying to get rid of stock. And that's it doing. That's a lot of cocaine. Yeah, it's for him and his uh, wife for the week. Wow. Aiden's phone won't stop buzzing, and it's time for his next loyal customer. Yeah, just jump in there, see? What are you doing to me? Yeah, no, I've got a quiet one tonight. No, you're not having a quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, enjoy enjoying that. Let me know what you think, anyway, so I can stick it with you all. Sam, all this. Enjoy your day. So do you feel like beneath all of this fun, there's a dark side of Ibiza? A hundred percent. I feel like when you come here on a holiday, this is the best place ever. But if you stay here for longer than a month, you'll see what it's actually like. And people 
acting like they're living in paradise, living the dream, but they're not really. Like, they're, they're telling themselves that so they can stay a bit longer. And they like the sun and they like the free drink. But I don't think a lot of the people that are actually here working are happy, realistically. Like, feels like just the eternal sesh. It's kind of pet and pie. Yeah, but it goes from the eternal sesh that's fun to the eternal sesh because I had no other choice and I can't afford food. Wow. That's bleak. Yeah. And that's the troubling side of it. I think that's what happens, I think, with age or with kind of experience. There is a period in your life where the eternal sesh sounds like a fucking dream. It's similar to like when you're younger and you have maybe, this is a weird example, but you have like, you know, maybe Nutella in your house is a treat. It was in my house. And then you finally become old and, you know, it's a treat to the point where your mom might flip and hide the jar or it's in like a really high cabinet that you can't reach. And then you get to a point where you're able to kind of make your own money. And sometimes the first thing that you end up doing is kind of fulfilling those kind of things that you were not able to kind of do to your heart's content, to your heart's desire. So you go out and you buy as many fucking Nutella jars as possible and you have it every single day, any time of the day, because you can now, because you're an adult, you can do your own thing. So that's the kind of same thing with a sesh. You start doing sesh, especially when you've got no money. Those type of things are incredible. You hang out with people. You're up for loads of days. You're meeting loads of people. You're going to after party after after party after after party. You're turning up to work on Monday, completely yacked out of your brain. And it's a fun story to tell your friends over the fucking coffee machine. But then the older you get, the more responsibilities you have, the more life experience that you have in general, suddenly that kind of old weekend shift or sesh stuff becomes something a bit of a kind of living nightmare so if you don't want to live for again because the hangovers are brutal and because usually if you're kind of indulging in those things on a kind of weekly basis it kind of you know it's kind of safe to assume other parts of your life are probably not all gucci there are some people that i do know who are able to sesh incredibly hard and also be able to kind of hold down pretty good jobs and do well for themselves. But for the most part, most of us don't have that luxury. So you have to choose one or the other. But I can't, again, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to live that life out there in a place like Ibiza, which is essentially is paradise. It's essentially um, like someone else described to me the other day. It's basically like Miami for flipping Europeans. And you basically go out there to basically indulge, in your, indulge yourself. It's basically designed in a way to allow adults to kind of you know do whatever the fuck they want you have access to literally everything and essentially um all of your vices are at arms you know are only kind of a couple digits on a fucking phone away which obviously allows you to kind of do some scary stuff so this documentary definitely was an eye-opener in that regard and definitely on one part it got me kind of intrigued to go to Ibiza and check it out as a party island and a scene but it also made me understand and respect people who are able to kind of live out there and you know do the do do what they needs to be done without maybe getting lost in the source because the temptation from you know all around you must be insane because you know the documentary even says there are dealers in terms of on the beach i think the senegalese crew are people that deal the, the taxi drivers or cab drivers that pick you up from the airport who are scouting people to kind of pick up on the streets they're dealing um the people in the club are dealing uh you've got fucking bartenders dealing like everybody has got drugs in some respect the seasonal workers are doing kind of tours they're dealing it's absolutely crazy it's a temptation that lies in every single corner so for those people that are out there and are doing the good thing and not kind of you know getting into that temptation then i really do respect you uh, you know on another another level because i don't know if i could handle that kind of level of fucking temptation i'm not going to lie as destructive as it may be so big up those people who are able to do that what are you guys saying in the chat i can't believe you haven't been to abifa for yet says koila yeah and, um to be fair like i'm i guess my temperament is like i'm a bit of a weird one i don't really like way to say but like sunny hot climates aren't usually for me i think because i sweat so much and i get self-conscious about it i don't like to be places where i feel like i'm fucking melting and i feel uncomfortable and i'm always twitching and fidgeting because i feel like my clothes are stuck all over me and i've got sweat patches everywhere so i tend to kind of prefer to go to places that are a little colder for some reason i think that's why i haven't really been to um a place like i be for even though i went to nicaragua a few years ago to travel and stuff i haven't really been anywhere else like that super hot i tend to kind of prefer places that are a little bit more rough around the edges i think abifa is a bit too shiny for me um in that respect probably 